Good morning. My name is Evelyn Craighead, a slave of Jesus Christ, and I would like to welcome you to the Feeding House Ministries, a teaching ministry that focuses on your soul and your eternal destiny, a ministry that uncompromisingly teaches the truth of God's Word. And our scripture teaching this morning comes from Deuteronomy chapter 14. And I will be reading verses 1 through 2 and 22 through 29 from the New King James Version. You are the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves nor shave the front of your head for the dead. You are a holy people to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year, and you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil of the firstborn and of your herds and flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. But if the journey is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe, or if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, when the Lord your God has blessed you, then you shall exchange it for money. Take the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. And you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep, for wine or similar drink, for whatever your heart desires. You shall eat there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in you and your household. You shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, for he has no part nor inheritance with you. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates, may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. My subject for this morning is the mark of a believer as a child of God. As a believer, there are laws that mark you as a child of God. Amen. Laws that mark you as holy, different, distinctive. And if we look at the world around us, through the eyes of God's word, we will see just how much evil is sweeping the earth. Amen. Evil that most people never think of as evil. Mm -hmm. Arrogance, selfishness, covetousness, greed, immorality, sexual perversion, abuse, brutality, mm -hmm. lawlessness, and violence. Yes. Lives are being wrecked. And people are being slaughtered every day because of the rampage of evil on this earth. Amen. And this was the situation that confronted the Israelite believers. They were soon to enter the promised land and lay claim to their inheritance. And once they entered, they would face temptation after temptation mm -hmm. to indulge in the immoral and lawless behavior of their neighbors. Therefore, Moses had to prepare them for the onslaught of temptation that would attack them. As the people of God, he had to prepare them to stand strong because they were to live holy lives, lives that were set apart totally to God. Amen. They were the people of God. Therefore, they were to be marked by the character of God. Mm -hmm. Just as God was holy, they were to be holy. Just as God was pure and righteous, they were to be pure and righteous. They weren't to be conformed to the immoral and lawless ways of this world. They were to demonstrate a transformed life, a life of righteousness. Amen. They were to bear a strong testimony to the immoral, lawless, and unruly neighbors who surrounded them. They were to display a testimony of holy living. Mm -hmm. And this is an important message. Because there are laws that mark the believer as a child of God, as holy, as different, as distinctive. Yes. Scripture says you are the children of the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. You shall not cut yourselves nor shave the front of your head for the dead. For you are a holy people of the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. As a believer, 
you must not bear the marks of false religion. Mm. False as being bogus, misleading, deceptive, untrue, inaccurate, incorrect, wrong, or flawed. Amen. Once you become a follower of the Lord, you must put off the works of darkness. Amen. You must have nothing to do with false worship and false religion. You must not participate in the ritual, ceremonies, practices, ordinances, sacraments, sacraments, services, or social activities of false religion. Mm -hmm. As a believer, you're never to participate in any practices of false religion. You're not to be identified with false religion, and neither are you to bear the marks of false religion. Yeah. The Israelites had been saved from Egypt delivered from the slavery of the world to become followers of the Lord God himself. Therefore, the Israelites were to bear the marks of God, mm -hmm. not the marks of false religion. And Moses declared this wonderful truth to the Israelites. You are the children of the Lord your God. Yes. God has saved the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery to become his children, the family of God. Mm -hmm. And as the children of God, the Israelites were to honor God by bearing a strong testimony to his name. They were to take on the nature of God. They were to live as a new creature transformed by God. Yes. The old behavior of the world was to pass away, and all behavior was to become new. They were to bear the marks of God's character, not the marks of the world and its false religions. Yes. But notice the particular mark of false religion used by Moses to illustrate this point. Because it concerns the way a person mourned for the dead. When a person died, loved ones mourned by disfiguring their bodies in pagan-like rituals. Mm. It was a common practice for a person to cut his hair on the sides or to make himself completely bald or to clip off the edges of his beard during the grieving ritual. It was also a common practice for a person to cut himself and draw blood. Very simply, scripture is saying, you're the children of the Lord your God. Yes. When someone dies, don't cut yourselves or shave your heads to show your sadness. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 16 verses 5 through 7 says, For thus says the Lord God, Do not enter the house of mourning, nor go to layman or bemoan them. For I have taken away my peace from this people, says the Lord, loving kindness and mercies. Both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, neither shall men lament for them, cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them, nor shall men break bread in mourning for them, to comfort them for the dead, nor shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or their mother. Among some false religions, mutilation of the body has been a common practice, a common ritual. But this isn't to be so, not among God's people. Amen. As believers, mm -hmm. as God's people, we must not bear the marks of false religion. Yes. There is to be no participation in false worship and there is to be no practice adopted from false religion. Yes. As a believer, you are not to be conformed to the false religions and practices of this world. You are to be you are to live a transformed life, a life that turns away from the practices of false re religion and turns to God. Amen. As a true, genuine believer, you become a follower of God, obeying God and keeping His commandments. Yes. You take on the nature and character of God, bearing strong testimony to the immoral, lawless, and false worshipers who surround you. But I want you to notice two reasons mm -hmm. as to why God's people must not bear the marks of false religion. First, because we are holy. Didn't scripture say you are holy? Yeah. This simply means that you are set apart to God, that you are dedicated, consecrated, and devoted to God, and that you are to live different lives, pure and righteous lives, lives that honor and bear a strong testimony to God's holy name. Amen. And to be holy means that you live a different kind of life. Mm -hmm. You live a distinctive life, distinctive in that you live a pure and righteous life, yeah. distinctive in that you shun the immoral and wicked things of this world. Mm -hmm. As a genuine believer, you're to have nothing to do with false religions and worship of this world. God has chosen, had chosen the Israelites to be his holy people. Therefore, this was the kind of life they were to live before God, a life that was totally 
set apart to him. Amen. Second, God's people were chosen to be a people for himself, a very special treasure, mm -hmm. a treasured possession of God. Yes. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6 says, For you are a holy people to the Lord, your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Amen. But notice this fact. God didn't choose the Israelites because they were special. On the contrary, they were a stiff-necked, stubborn people. Mm. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 6 says, Therefore understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. God chose the Israelites to be his special people, his special witnesses and missionary force to the lost and dying of the world. Mm -hmm. When God saved the Israelites out of Egypt, there was nothing special about them. Mm -hmm. They were slaves, poor and destitute, and by the other nations of the world, they were considered to be the scum of the earth. Well. But still God saved them. And he saved them to become his special treasure, the people who would become the true witnesses of God on this earth. Mm. But he chose them by his grace, not because of any merit or value that was in them. Yes. It was God's sovereign choice and God's will alone that chose them to be his special people. Amen. And because God had chosen them, because they were his special people, his treasured possession, mm -hmm. they must not bear the marks of false religion. Amen. They must live pure, pure and holy lives, obeying God and keeping his commandments. They were to be a strong testimony and a strong witness for God to the immoral, lawless, and unruly of this earth. Yes. They were to bear the marks of God himself, mm -hmm. not the marks of false religion and worship. And as believers, we must not participate in any practice of false religion or false worship. Mm -hmm. We must not participate in any ritual, study, service, worship, social, or recreational activity. As believers, we are to be holy, yeah. separated, and set apart to God. Amen. We are to live lives that are distinct and different, lives that are entirely different from the immoral, lawless, and unruly of this world. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 1 verses 74 to 75 says, To grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. Amen. As believers, we are to live lives that are holy and righteous, lives that are pure and just, lives that bear a strong testimony and witness to the immoral, the wicked, and the false worshipers of this evil world. And as believers, we must live holy lives, lives that are totally set apart to God, lives that are righteous and pure. As believers, we are chosen to be God's people, mm -hmm. his special treasure, his treasured possession. Therefore, as believers, we must never, not ever, participate in any practice of false worship. Amen. Deuteronomy 11 verse 16 says, Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn away and serve other gods and worship them. Scripture says you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. As a believer, you must tithe. Amen. And seldom does a subject grab the attention of a congregation as much as money. And in this scripture, Moses gives a strong sermon on stewardship. Mm -hmm. Standing there preaching to the people, he covers seven truths about tithing. Truths that are applicable to any generation of believers. Mm -hmm. The first truth is that tithing is to be a regular practice. Each year, the Israelites were to set aside one-tenth of their produce as a tithe to the Lord. Mm. Through Moses, God told his people exactly how much they could keep and how much they were to give, and the tithe was to be given year by year. Amen. Scripture says, And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. The second truth is that tithing is to be offered at the worship center, the church, in the presence of the Lord. The Israelites were to take a tithe of their grain, 
new wine, oil, and the firstborn of their herds and flocks mm -hmm. to the worship center and offer them to the Lord. But notice exactly where the tithe was to be offered. It was to be offered at the worship center chosen by God, the worship center that he honored, <coughs> the worship center where he chose to place his name. Yes. And the central worship center chosen by God was the tabernacle and later the temple. Mm -hmm. And wherever the tabernacle or temple was located mm -hmm. in the future, that's where God's people, believers, were to take their tithes. Yes. The third truth is that tithing is to be a spiritual testimony. You may not believe this, but tithing strengthens your reverence and fear of the Lord. Amen. It also teaches others to reverence and fear the Lord. When an Israelite tithed, he was declaring that he trusted God mm -hmm. and that he depended upon God. And he knew that he was dependent upon God for health to work and earn a living. He knew that he was dependent upon God for a job, mm -hmm. for the strength of the economy, for rain and for a fruitful crop and food. Yeah. And he knew that he was totally dependent upon God for the necessities of life. Yeah. This was yeah. the very reason he was tithing, to demonstrate his love, his dependence, and his trust in God. Thus his tithing served to strengthen his own faith, mm -hmm. as well as to teach others to reverence and fear the Lord. The fourth truth is that tithing is to be a flexible law. Scripture says if the money, if the journey is too long for you so that you are not able to carry the tithe, or if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, when the Lord your God has blessed you. In tithing, a person's circumstances or a situation are to be considered. And the circumstances covered by Moses involved a person who lived too far away to carry his tithe to the worship center. And there could be other factors as well, but the tithe was still to be given to the Lord. Amen. Scripture says, then you shall exchange it for money, take the money in your hand, and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses. In such a situation, a person could exchange the tithe, his crops, and his animals for silver. Scripture says, and you shall spend the money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep, for wine or similar drink, for whatever your heart desires. You shall eat there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. A person could then use the silver to buy whatever offering he needed to tithe at the worship center. Mm -hmm. But notice this fact. It was this flexibility that led the priest of later generations to place money changers in the temple courts. Mm. John chapter 2 verses 14 through 16 says, And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, poured out the changers' money, and turned over, overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. The point to see is the concern of God for the extreme circumstances of his people. Mm -hmm. Living in an imperfect world, believers, God's people, sometimes get themselves in financial binds. And in such circumstances, the law of tithing has to be flexible until the person can get out from under the financial difficulty. However, you must never use your circumstances as an excuse for not giving your tithe and offering to the Lord. Yes. As a believer, if you're so irresponsible that you get yourself into a financial bind, mm -hmm. you must immediately attack the problem. You must correct the situation because God doesn't want any believer under the pressure of financial difficulties. Yes. As a believer, you're to straighten out any financial predicament you're in so that you're not only able to tithe, but that you will also have enough to give to the needy. The fifth truth is that tithing is to be a joyful experience. When the Israelites took their offerings to the central worship center, they were to eat and rejoice around a fellowship meal cooked from a part of the tithe. This was to be a joyful time mm -hmm. that was to be shared with other believers at the worship center. Scripture says, you shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, for he has no part nor inheritance with you. 
At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and stranger and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands which you do. The sixth truth is that tithing is to be a benevolent witness for the Lord, a compassionate, kind, and generous witness for the Lord. Notice the law. Every third year, the Israelite believers were to take the tithe of their produce and store it in each town. And the purpose for this storage was to provide for the Levite ministers and the needy of every town, the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows of the community. And the support of the Levite ministers is emphasized because the people were never to neglect the Levite ministers. Amen. The support of the Levite ministers and supporting them was an absolute necessity mm -hmm. because they received no allotment or inheritance in the promised land. They were to focus totally on the Lord and not on financial and business matters. Their call was to minister to the people and to teach them the ways of God. Yes. Therefore, the people must support them. Amen. The second truth is that tithing is to be a beneficial exercise, a useful, helpful, and valuable exercise. If the Israelite believers were faithful in tithing, God promised to bless them in all the work of their hands. Mm -hmm. Whatever they did with their hands, his job or their job or employment would be blessed by God. Amen. Malachi 3 verse 10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the window of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. The Lord's challenge and promises to the tither are certain. After identifying and condemning the people for cheating him, the Lord gave his people a twofold challenge along with several promises. The first challenge was that the people were to bring all their tithes into the storehouse, the temple, the church. Only by giving the Lord and his servants what was rightfully theirs could Israel hope to have the curse removed and begin to enjoy the blessings of God. Mm -hmm. Second, the people were to test and prove the promises God was making. They were to try him and see. Yeah. And if the people lived up to their end of the covenant, mm -hmm. if they lived up to their responsibilities, God was sure to live up to his. Amen. And the Lord's promises were threefold. But before looking at the promises, we need to recognize that God could have granted these blessings any time he wanted. But to bless the people while they lived in sin, to bless them while they were robbing him, mm. would have sent the wrong message. Yeah. And God wasn't willing to bless his people when they were unwilling to bless others. But if the people would test him and obey him, he would open the floodgates of heaven yeah. and pour out mm. unlimited blessings. He would give abundant harvest and prosperity by guarding their crops from insects and disease. And he would give the obedient a life that was greatly blessed, a life that was full of joy and delight. Mm. However, many of us today fail to realize that when we fail to tithe, when we fail to give too little or give less than what God says or lays on our hearts to give, we are robbing God. Amen. We also need to keep in mind that God asks for more than our money. He wants us to use our time and our talents to further his kingdom. Because when we fail to tithe our time and talents, mm -hmm. we're guilty of disobedience and failure to seek, discover, and use our spiritual gifts is a waste of our God-given blessings. Amen. It's also a tool of the devil to steer us into disobedience to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And when we fail to do any of these things, we show disdain for the Lord and his laws. Yes. And God's word is very clear about our duty as believers to tithe and give. Mm -hmm. And so there are laws that mark the believer as a child of God, as holy, different, distinctive, 
And the first law is that you are not to bear the marks of false religion, yes. remembering that you are a child of God. Amen. And the mark concerns the way you mourn for the dead, and the reasons for being different is that you are holy. You are chosen to be God's treasured possession. But as a believer, there is another law. You must tithe. And tithing is to be a regular practice that's to be offered at the worship center, the church. And tithing is to be a spiritual testimony mm -hmm. because tithing strengthens and teaches us reverence and fear of the Lord. Yes. Tithing is to be a flexible law. Thus, a person's circumstances or situation are to be considered. And the circumstances may be that that person lives too far away to carry his tithe. However, the person could exchange the tithe for crops and animals or for silver. And the person could then use the silver to buy whatever he wanted as a tithe at the worship center. Tithing is to be a joyful experience, yes. and tithing is to be a benevolent witness, a compassionate, generous, kind witness. Yes. And the law was to store all the tithing produce in each town every third year. And the purpose was to provide for the ministers and needy of every town. Therefore, tithing is to be a fruitful exercise. Amen. When you tithe, you will be blessed by God. All your effort will be blessed, mm. and all your labor will be blessed. Are you a tither? Because this is the mark of a believer. This is the mark of a true child of God. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you once again for all that you're teaching us in your word. Not to follow false religions or participate in any of their rituals and ceremonies. Not to take on any of the characteristics of false religion. And to tithe. And that true believers do with what you have entrusted to our stewardship. Thank you, Lord, for every word that you teach us. That we may walk in it and be a better witness and testimony for you in this lost and dying world. In Jesus' name, amen.